Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Ellie Hassenfeld about assessment strategies for charities, evaluating effective giving outcomes, and why intervention programs fail. Just so you know, we have once again included links in the show notes if you'd like to donate to organizations that are helping the people of Ukraine. And now, here's the conversation between Spencer and Ellie. Ellie, welcome. Hey, Spencer, it's great to be here. So I think almost everyone in our audience will have heard of GiveWell, which is the organization that you founded that helps figure out which charities are highly effective. And so I just want to start with like a very brief intro to what GiveWell does. We'll blow through that quickly since most people are familiar with it. And then I want to dig into a, a number of interesting topics related to how do you evaluate the effectiveness of charities? How do you figure out how to do good in the world? How do you evaluate evidence that I think uh, our audience will find interesting, even if they've heard all about GiveWell before? So with that, why don't you just start off, off give us just a quick intro. What is GiveWell? Uh, what's your mission with it? Yeah. Um, so GiveWell is the organization I co-founded and We do research on giving opportunities in low and middle income countries. So countries that are poorer than the United States, other wealthier countries around the world. We do research and then direct funding to organizations that will, in our opinion, help people as much as possible. When GiveWell started, we functioned more as a website that people came to and used our research to decide where they would give. We still have our website. There's a lot of information there for anyone who's interested, but largely function more as a grant maker, which means that by and large donors are giving us money and asking us to direct it for them or asking us for advice. And we're giving them recommendations about where they should direct their money in low and middle income countries. Great. So I think one thing that really sets GiveWell apart from other charity evaluators, like people who might have heard of like Charity Navigator or GuideStar, things like that, is that rather than trying to give a rating to you know some huge number of charities, you're really trying to focus on a small number that you think are very likely to be extremely impactful and where you can be reasonably confident in that impact rather than, you know, let's give a rating to everything. Do you want to just comment on sort of that approach and how that differs from what else is out there? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of ways that GiveWell is very different. So the first is what you're describing. To make it concrete, last year, we raised about $500 million. And our mission is to try and determine how to give away that $500 million in the way that will help people as much as possible. And ultimately, that meant that we directed those funds, I don't know the exact number, but to something more like 20 organizations than to very many. And the majority of those funds went to a very small number of organizations working in areas like malaria and other child health programs that we believe will use that money to do a great deal of good. We are not trying to be a database of charities. We're not trying to offer a objective or a fair rating to every charity that exists in the world or even every charity that works internationally. Instead, we're trying to figure out how to get that money to the places that will do the most. And to that end, we're, we're focused on a few criteria. We're focused on organizations that either have or will generate significant evidence demonstrating that their programs are working. We're assessing the cost effectiveness of those programs. So we're saying, if this charity receives X dollars, how much good will it do in terms of lives saved or improved? And we're, we're very focused on how organizations will use additional money. Meaning we're not just saying on average over the past five years, how much good did this organization do with the money it received? But instead, how much good do we think it will do with a marginal influx of donations? I remember reading a blog post from someone in the sort of more traditional charity world about how they first found GiveWell. And it was was pretty hilarious because they were talking about how they discovered you all and they were super excited by your approach. And then they go look at your list of recommended charities and they like almost fell off their seat because they like couldn't believe that, you know, for years and years of operating, how few charities are listed as your recommended ones. So that just blew their mind. Yeah, what's your thought on that? Like people might think, well, you know, you've spent so many years analyzing charities. Why aren't there way more that you're finding that are cost effective? We're trying to find the places to put money that will do the most. And for example, malaria is a disease that kills a huge number of people every year, more than 500,000. And there are really cheap, effective commodity solutions, uh, malaria nets, preventative medicine, now uh, a vaccine that can prevent a great deal of the number of cases from malaria and then the resulting deaths. 
But nonetheless, it remains a huge burden of disease because there's insufficient funding. And so the question we're trying to answer is, how do we use money to accomplish the most good? And when we look at malaria, we see the existence of a place where additional dollars can do a lot of good. And we don't really care if there's like 20 other things we could do. We're fine recommending funding or a lot of funding to malaria as long as the dollars that will go there are going to save and improve more lives than than dollars going anywhere else. Um, So to be clear, you know, we don't only recommend malaria, but um, there's nothing about our model that would require us or would make us prefer to have more recommendations for the sake of it. Instead, it's about uh, where will charitable dollars have the highest return on dollars donated. Wouldn't it still be valuable, though, to have more, if you could find more that are about on par? Because then they would just uh, increase the capacity for the amount of money you could move. You wouldn't like kind of hit these capacity limits. So other things equal, I think there's a lot of reasons that REF would be better. So you're pointing to one, which is, you know, one of the things we wrote about at the end of last year is that we felt like it was a struggle for us to find enough, what we call room for more funding, you know, basically programs that can absorb as much money as we would want to direct to them. And so we're running up against some of that capacity limits and we need to find more things. Breath could be one way of addressing the capacity constraint. You know, another one is to just find uh, a small number of programs that are really large. So for example, to us, we would be indifferent between 10 programs, each of which could absorb $500 million and one program that could absorb $5 billion. Those are, you know, equivalent um, to us. Um, And there's other reasons that breath can be helpful. You know, one of the really challenging questions that we grapple with is something we refer to as moral weights. How do you weigh the good accomplished by increasing someone's income against the good accomplished by averting a death? And we take a particular perspective on how to differentiate or how to ex- what the exchange rate is between those two outcomes uh, as best we can. But, you know, if, if donors have very different opinions, they might want to have more options available to them because if someone values income much more highly than GiveWell does, then they would significantly prefer some option that we haven't recommended to them. And so more breath could increase capacity. More breath could also give donors the opportunity to, you know, make their own judgments when they have different opinions based on underlying philosophical values. Yeah, I'm imagining now kind of a two-axis system, like a chart, where let's say on the x-axis is the number of lives saved per dollar, and on the y-axis is, let's say, the amount of well-being for people alive per dollar, something like this, right? And you could imagine there could be this efficient frontier of charities where on the efficient frontier— you can move to increase the number of lives saved, but sacrifice some well-being, right? Or you can go the other way and you could have reasonable people disagree, right? Because it's sort of totally unclear which is better, right? It's like really a philosophical consideration. On the other hand, a lot of charities just don't fall on the efficient frontier at all, right? A lot of charities, like you could actually just get strictly more of what they're doing for the same amount of money, right? Like if they're saving a certain number of lives and increasing well-being a certain amount, you can just get more lives and more well-being saved without sacrificing anything. So I'm wondering, is this kind of how you think about it? We use a threshold. And the way that we, we think about our threshold is in terms of multiples of the impact one could have by uh, just giving people with very low incomes cash. And then we'll talk about the opportunities we're giving to as being some multiple of that threshold. Uh, so one of the organizations we've looked at a lot over the years is Give Directly, a group that uh, directs cash to very poor people. That would be 1x cash because you're giving cash. Uh, a lot of the malaria recommendations we've made, we believe, are around uh, 10x cash. Um, so about 10 times as much good accomplished using the uh, sort of exchange rate between income or consumption increases and uh, death deaths averted that we've used in our framework. Um, I think... To your point, when if someone were to show up and to say, I actually value income much more highly, that could lead them to, you know, weigh income increases much more highly than we have and prefer something else, you know, relative to a malaria recommendation. Well, let's go back to these kind of more intrinsic goods, though, of like saving a life, preventing someone from dying that would have died versus like increasing well-being of a living person, right? Like there's a philosophical debate about how valuable each of those is. And it sounded like you were saying that there's some kind of internal exchange rate you use between the two to get your final numbers. Do you want to just comment? Like, how do you actually navigate that? 
Um, like, how do we come up with the exchange rate that we'll use between well-being? Yeah, like, so, like, giving people cash, there's some chance it, like, saves people's lives. Like, maybe it saves the lives of their children because they can afford medicine, right? But it also increases well-being, presumably, right? And so you're getting kind of these two different benefits in different amounts versus, let's say, giving people bed nets where, you know, there's a different, you know, different amount of, like, lives saved and, and you know, well-being increased, right? And so you essentially have these two fundamental goods. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, how do you actually trade them off against each other in practice? Yeah. So there's several things that we've done. I mean, I think the most important point to make is that this is not a question where we feel like we have the right answer, quote unquote, or one could have the right answer because it relies on unanswerable questions. But the types of things that we've done are the following. So to try and come up with some sort of like how many dollars or how much of an increase in consumption is worth averting a death, we've Looked at academic literature that tries to value a statistical life and say, you know, what cost of regulation are governments willing to undertake for the sake of, uh, you know, saving a life? So you can look at data along those lines. That's like one category of information. Another category is we've worked with external research organizations to survey people living in low income countries, Kenya, Ghana, and ask them. Uh, how would you trade off between these two things? How would you trade off between the potential loss of a child and some increased income? I mean, these are like really hard questions to ask, really hard questions to answer. It's another one of the inputs into how we're trying to arrive at this exchange rate. Um, a third thing we've done is survey people in our donor community and basically say, you are deciding where to give your money. Let's try to get an aggregate of how you see this question and what you would do. And then finally, trying to do some of the empirical analysis that you're gesturing at, um, saying if someone were to receive cash, how do we think that would play out in practice? How much would go to children's education or food or medicine? And what would, how, what would that lead to long term? Um, and then essentially trying to put that all together into something that is like an exchange rate between the two things. That's super interesting because there's this fundamental problem in philosophy that's been debated for like thousands of years. Like, what is the good, right? And you have to actually make decisions about it on hundreds of millions of dollars. I, you know, I don't envy you that part of your job. That just sounds like incredibly difficult. And I find it fascinating that you actually ask people things like, how much would you be willing to risk your life in order to get this much other benefit? And essentially, that's almost like pushing it into a kind of a preference utilitarianism frame, saying, well, how much do we value like dying versus well-being? Well, let's like ask people how they value it. And let's like base it on that. So I'm wondering, does this idea of like satisfying people's preferences are you thinking of that explicitly or do you have a different way of looking at that? I think it's an important input. You know, we're trying to improve the lives of people in low-income countries. And so, like you said, we're faced with the choice of to what extent do we choose to support their incomes and ability to buy the things they want versus uh, provide health commodities that prevent illness and death. It's a really important input. Like, what do they want? What do the people whom we're trying to help, what would they prefer? And so we, we want to take that into account. We haven't just taken the uh, literal results of the preference surveying we've done uh, and, and just kind of like made them flow all the way through for a couple of reasons. But one of the most basic is I think that I'm not even sure that the results we got are, are, are uh, high quality enough and like would be replicated if we were to try that we want to take the uh, sort of quantitative outputs of those surveys at face value. But yeah, yeah we've written all about that on our website and, and people are interested and can go and take a look and sort of dig into it. But, you know, I definitely think that there's no doubt that the preferences of the people we're trying to help are an incredibly important input into the question of like, how should we trade off between the different goods? So it sounds like right now it's kind of a synthesis. You're using a bunch of different techniques, trying to put them together into something sort of mostly coherent and then use that? Yeah, exactly right. Like, I, I think it, it is trying to take, look at this problem from a lot of different angles, recognize that we're not going to uh, sort of get the right answer. There, there is no right answer. Um, and then over time, continuing to hear from other people about like what we're missing and, and how we need to update it so we can keep, you know, moving closer to what, get closer to the, to the better direction of, of how to make this trade-off. I think if I were you, I would be tempted to assign different buckets of the portfolio to different moral theories, since it's so hard to know which ones to apply. Like, okay, this part of the portfolio is going to be, you know, straight up hedonic utilitarianism. This other bucket, we're going to like use more of a preference utilitarianism frame or whatever, and, and just do it that way. I'm wondering, has that ever, have you ever considered that approach? 
We've thought about it a little bit and, um, you know, Open Philanthropy, which is an organization that, that anyhow, like started within GiveWell now is, is it's an independent organization, has talked about its own work on worldview diversification, or it does something that's somewhat like this. I think for us, there are two big obstacles that prevented us from going down this path with GiveWell's work today. The first is, uh, I think it's just hard to draw clean lines around these buckets in ways that we would find satisfying. So, you know, one could say, well, let's draw the line around the health bucket and the income bucket. That's how we framed it. Um, it's not clear to us like where those lines would would end. And so we didn't we didn't love that path. And then the second reason is to the extent that we do have a belief, notwithstanding the challenge of answering these questions, I think like one move that GiveWell has made pretty strongly over the last 10 years is slowly moving towards valuing health more and more over time. And that's the move towards valuing health more has come from pretty much all of the different inputs that I mentioned before. And so as we've moved towards valuing health more than we did previously, we really believe we should be directing more money to health oriented programs because we believe they are accomplishing more good and creating the constraint of having to allocate X some money to a bucket that's inconsistent with what we think would be the best way to allocate money means we're just leaving utility on the table. Could you explain a little more about your change in thinking around health and why you think like health interventions are more effective now than you used to think? Yeah, I mean, so it really came from all the different inputs I mentioned. So I think like in our earliest days, we realized we had this problem. Uh, how do you trade off between income increasing and death averting programs? And at the time, Gosh, I mean, we're going like way, way, way back into sort of ancient GiveWell history. So probably more than 10 years ago now, we just said, I don't know, let's let's try to come up with our own rough rule of thumb uh, for what that might be. And we, we anyhow, we had some exchange rate. I don't remember what it was, but it was like largely based on like, you know, intuition and maybe like a small degree of surveying some academic literature. And then over time, we did more surveying of our donor audience. We did the work to uh, go out and fund a group to go out and then report back to us on preferences of people in low-income countries, did some more of the empirical work, looked more closely at the evidence. And all of that shifted us more in the direction of valuing health more highly relative to income than we had previously. So one framework that people often use in the development world, as I understand it, are qualities and dollies. And so do you want to just briefly explain what those are and like what your or GiveWell's view on those are and how much they factor into your work? Yeah, so um, the one that's used most often in uh, global health is the DALI or the Disability Adjusted Life Year. And the idea is one wants to first take into account the number of years of life remaining for any health program. So um, this sort of intuition that we have that the death of a young person is more tragic than the death of an elderly person may come from the fact that the young person literally has more years of life left to live. And then the other goal of the framework is to be able to put uh, death averting programs and health improving programs into similar terms. So, you know, one program might avert a case of malaria for which someone, you know, might have flu like symptoms for a week. And then, you know, this is another program might avert the death of a person you know, the averting the death, how do we put those into similar terms so we can weigh them against each other? And so the disability adjusted life year framework is doing both of those. It's putting everything in terms of life year equivalents, where we're looking at life expectancy remaining. And then for each non-death causing disease, uh, everything gets a disability weight, where that disability weight is some percentage of complete death. So something that would be like extraordinarily severe could be, you know, practically death could be 0.9. So practically a full year of life lost, something that is, you know, very, very mild, you know, could, could be a very, very, very small number. Um, but you can then use those to aggregate up and say in total, how many years of health improvement are we getting an expectation from the, the program we're funding? So how do you think about these in your own work? Do you rely on them? And if not, why not? We heavily rely on the dallies in a lot of ways, but don't fully take them, you know, without any adjustment. When it comes to applying a disability weight to a condition, so how bad is it to have anemia 
how bad is it to, you know, have some have some disease? We, we tend to just take the disability weight because I don't think we have a better way of coming up with a, a, a disability weight than what the um, the people who put the dallies together have, have already come up with. So we tend to use them. The main place that we have adjusted is I think a lot of people have this moral intuition that the death of a, and, and we're going to get sort of into like somewhat uh, intense territory here. So I don't know if there's like a trigger warning for deaths of young children, but I think this is a topic that is hard for a lot of people to, to, to think and talk about. A huge portion of the child mortality, so deaths of children under the age of five, comes from deaths of children in the first 24 hours of life, the first week of life, or the first month of life in low-income countries. And I think a lot of people have the intuition that the, you know, the death of a one-day-old is less tragic than, say, the death of a five-year-old. To some extent, that may be due to like a pure life expectancy projection, where in many places, you know, literally like one day old, your life expectancy may not be as high as for a five-year-old, though I'm I'm not 100% sure of that. So one should uh, fact check me before taking that at face value. But I think beyond that, we have like an intuition that there's some difference in the, quote, moral value of the one-day-old than the five-year-old. It seems like there's sort of these competing intuitions we have, right? On the one hand, I think people tend to feel that someone who's like very, very old that it's less tragic that if they die than someone who's younger because they sort of have less life ahead of them. But on the other hand, a baby that's just born, they don't have goals, they don't have as much like social connection to the world, and maybe that makes it less bad to a lot of people. Do you think that that's what's going on partially? I think it's some of that that's going on. And there was a paper whose title I don't remember that someone from the effective altruism community wrote on this topic. And I think that the intuition you're describing about connection to the world, personal goals is is also part of this. But this fact that many people, um, though certainly not all, many people have this intuition that we should sort of downweight the moral weight of the the extraordinarily young is another reason we just don't take the daily figures literally in our work. Instead, we have age weights that we apply for the very young that effectively the moral weight of, of, of a very young person increases rapidly in their first few years. It's interesting. You're almost doing kind of empirical philosophy where you're like, well, we don't know the answer to this really difficult philosophical question. So let's see what people think about it. And then we'll kind of like use people's intuitions on that topic to answer the difficult philosophical question. I don't know if you look at it that way, but it's kind of how I see what you're doing there. It's sort of what we what we are doing. I mean, I think that even in this conversation, the fear I have is that someone will think that, you know, we think we we have the answers or this is the, you know, quote, right way to do it. And, and it's not how we feel. Like we know that we don't know. But what makes GiveWell interesting is we're faced with this practical challenge that on an ongoing basis, we have money to allocate. And we could ignore these questions. We could ignore the fact that, you know, we could we could just choose to say, let's pretend that we don't have constraints and we should you know, not try to deal with the trade-offs between the opportunities we have. Um, we could also abdicate and say, well, uh, you know, the daily framework exists. So Let's just use that and ignore the intuition that we have and that, uh, or I should say that I have, because I don't even think this intuition is held by everyone at GiveWell, but that let's say I have, other people have, that we should treat the extraordinarily young somewhat differently than the very young. Uh, we could choose to ignore that, uh, but we, we don't want to. And so instead, on an ongoing basis, we're trying to make the best decisions we have with the information we have and then update over time. And I think what's challenging is that we just have to make those decisions on an ongoing basis. We have, uh, you know, we we every year are gonna be giving or away money, directing money to the things that are best. And that's just part of the, the work we do, this sort of practical exercise of acting based on some of this like empirical information, but also some of the philosophical values that we have. Does this mean that people who follow that framework, they end up doing a ton of work that's just like basically saving the lives of like newborns? Well, relative to what we do, you'd be more likely to focus on newborns than on, you know, older people. Okay, but it doesn't it doesn't change the calculations dramatically where it ends up being a big factor? It changes it some. I think like roughly speaking, 50% of child deaths in low-income countries occur before the age of 1 month. I believe that's correct, even though that number sounds like that that's like pretty amazing, like pretty crazy. And so you know, even if you, quote, downweight 
the value of saving a one day old heavily, you still might end up putting a lot of your attention towards the, the very young because the potential impacts there are so large. But this is an area, these, these differences in philosophical values could lead people to arrive at very different conclusions than Givewell has. You know, if one says, I, I think, again, very roughly, and I don't have the numbers up in front of me, but if we were to say, maybe we currently give a one-month-old 50% of the value of a five-year-old, sort of in our frame, right? And so that's not so different to the point that um, differences in the cost of a program, the burden of the disease that, that you're attacking, those could easily overwhelm that moral difference. But if someone were to instead say, I, I, I wouldn't apply 50%, I'd apply five, a 5% threshold, um, you know, that could really change things relative to what Givel is doing today. Similarly, there was a time several years ago when there was sort of a line of thinking within Givel that said adults should be really highly valued. They have fewer years of life remaining, but um, you know, to some of the points you were raising earlier, they have, they're integrated into society. There are, are potentially harder to measure impacts of their dying. Therefore, maybe adults should be valued at an even higher level than children. And in either of those cases, if, if one had a view, was extreme relative to like Givel's current view, you could you would easily end up in a different place. So you said, oh man, like I don't want to be giving a lot to, to saving newborns. Um, yeah, that probably you would end up doing like fairly different things. Am I remembering correctly that Givewell once discovered a big mistake in the daily calculations of deworming interventions uh, that was being widely used? Yeah, there was this um, calculation in a report called the Disease Control Priorities Report, which was put out by the, the group that had put together these disability adjusted life years that said a certain type of deworming program was roughly $3.40 per valley averted. And that number had been arrived at based on some like erroneous underlying calculations. It was essentially a spreadsheet error, if I remember correctly. And it should have been 341 instead of $3.41. Um, we wrote a long blog post on our website about it uh, back in, uh, I think, 2011. Let me guess. Then they were like, we were wrong. You're totally right. And then everyone updated immediately. The funny thing is that there were other mistakes that were made that actually made it even, you know, that made it better, put it closer to like, if I, again, I don't remember all the details, but something like a hundred. So it was just, it was just a sort of a big mess. But then at the same time, there was this other set of research going on that was not directly related to this daily calculation, which was research done by Michael Kramer and Ted Miguel with a randomized trial of the effects of deworming. And they followed people over like a few years, uh, children, and saw that their school attendance was up. And then 10, 15, and, and now, gosh, I think like almost 20 years later, have seen very large income effects from in the, you know, being people who were in the treatment group and received this deworming treatment back in 1980, 1999, are earning much more as adults than they were as children. But basically, even in the, the blog post, I think that we wrote itself, what you see is we say there was this giant error and wow, this uh, calculation was way off. And we still plan to recommend funding to deworming organizations for these other reasons that make it look attractive to us. Yeah, it's wild. It was, I mean, it, it was off by, you know, a factor of up to 100 or you say maybe it ended up only being a factor of 30 or something. But it's, it's just kind of amazing that even with that huge discrepancy, it was still highly effective. But what was your reaction when, when you released this? I mean, you'd think a lot of people were making decisions based on these numbers. So I think the real question is I'm not, so I don't remember it particularly well. I'm not sure how many people were making decisions on these numbers. Oh, okay. So I thought there was like a big program funding these that had done these calculations, but maybe I'm misremembering. You know, there's a lot of attention paid to the numbers and, um, you know, certainly like plenty of high profile institutions were behind the report. But I think that, you know, in my experience, GiveWell is one of the few institutions that's, I don't know, like trying to make decisions based on cost effectiveness analysis in doing that in a sort of like consistent and principled way. The GiveWell cost effectiveness estimates are not the only input into our decisions to fund malaria programs and deworming programs. You know, there, there are some other factors, but they're certainly 80% plus of the case. And I think we're relatively unique in that way. I don't think there are other groups. I mean, certainly I can't think of anyone as I'm, as I'm sitting here now that are using numbers in that same way. 
And in some ways, I think that is why we have real value added in the world, because I don't think that explicit cost effectiveness estimates is the only way to give effectively, but it's certainly a strategy that I think should be employed significantly. And I'm glad that we can be the ones to come and employ it. Is there something kind of bizarre about this? I mean, there are so many groups that are trying to make an impact in the world, right? There's so many foundations, there's so many wealthy individuals giving money away. It's sort of just shocking on some level that there don't seem to be that many that are really saying, okay, well, given that we're trying to help the world, given that we're trying to do something altruistic, we might as well use our dollars as effectively as possible to achieve those goals. So like, what's going on here? Yeah, so I think it's surprising. So I think there's probably a few different things going on. One is that I think people have, you know, as you know, a lot of motivations for their giving. Maximizing impact is very rarely the main one. That fact alone filters out a lot of people who have other motives, either ones they're conscious about or not conscious about in their giving. I think the, the sort of second big reason is even doing this in a remotely credible way is like really, really, really hard. And I think, I don't know, maybe that'll be interesting to, to dig into a little bit, but I'll, get, I'll give like one example and then it'll lead to the sort of third reason I think this might be happening, which is a big question we have about the malaria recommendations we're making right now is to what extent is the money we direct displacing money that other funders would give to malaria? And those other funders would be, you know, the biggest global funders of malaria programs, the Global Fund, which is funded by many country governments, the US, the UK, et cetera. And then the United States' government's uh, President's Malaria Initiative, which is another big funder of malaria programs. And our best guess is that, roughly speaking, every dollar that we direct displaces about, you know, 40 to 50 cents of another funder's malaria program. And our, you know, cost effectiveness estimates take that into account in our final numbers, that we're displacing some money, it's going to something else, that something else is less cost effective. And just grappling with that and trying to work through it is really hard. And so I think there's a huge obstacle that is imposed by the recognition that making progress on explicit cost effectiveness estimation is very challenging. And then finally, you know, even in that example I just gave, and you know, we talked about moral weights earlier, there's no right answer. And so I think you very quickly, I think that the best argument that I could make for like the other side is some version of these cost effectiveness estimates are, they're, they're great, but someone could make an argument they're still missing, I don't know, 80% of what really matters. And one could argue that we're over relying on this very blunt instrument. And, you know, other approaches are equally good, whether those other approaches are, I don't know, trying to bet on great people or trying to invest in innovation, you know, other approaches that I think are not prima facie worse than what Gibble's doing. Okay, that's so interesting. I, I want to kind of go through those again, those three points you make, because they're, they're, each of them is fascinating and I think really, really important to discuss. So the other motives for giving, right? So that's one reason why people don't use your style of giving money away. You know, one could interpret that as like, oh, well, they're really doing it selfishly, right? And I think, you know, some people, when they do altruism, they, they're doing it selfishly, right? They're really just trying to socially signal or whatever. But there are tons of people who are really, truly altruistically motivated. They're not just doing it selfishly. And if I think if you were to like pin down most of those people and say, well, given that you're giving away $100, would you rather it like saves, you know, 0.1 person's life or 0.2 people's lives? And they would say, of course, I want to save more lives, not less, right? And I think they would genuinely mean that. So it still seems to me like a little bit of a mystery because I, like, I genuinely think that if that people do want to do more good for the same amount of money rather than less good. So what are your thoughts on that? I believe that the decision they're making, sort of their revealed preference, is not what they're saying when they answer the question rationally and say, I value saving you know, two people instead of one person. So, so I, think, I think there's probably two things going on. I think to some extent, Everyone, GiveWell has this experience, like we had this experience so much early in GiveWell, we'd pitch donors. And the entire time we would talk about what we're doing. That makes perfect sense. They love it, it's great. And we're like, so are you gonna give? And they're like, no, uh, we're gonna you know, keep giving to our, our local thing that we like, where we, we know everybody. And I think there was a disconnect between some version of rationally understanding what the correct thing to do is, and then taking that action. And somehow those two, ideas were divorced from each other. Could it be that, 
altruism in the human mind is primarily a kind of community oriented idea where, you know, if you think about like the survival of the human species, right? Like the benefits to altruism when it comes to survival have to do with your local group, like helping your local group and them helping you as opposed to, you know, helping people around the world. And could it be that like effective altruism essentially is like a hijacking of our cognitive architecture to do something that's just like totally unnatural for humans? Yeah, I think there could be all sorts of reasons that people prefer giving, you know, closer to their own community. You're describing one. I think another one is, well, in the end, there's a lot of signaling going on, uh, you know, even when it's not obviously, so even when it's not getting your name up on the building at a big university, uh, you still give within your community and people know that you gave or people see you giving, you're on some list and that is giving you some of that uh, local local benefit. I mean, I think a third one relates to another point I made, which is when you write a check and so, so I think there's two more things. When you write a check and it goes somewhere overseas, I think people have a little bit of this like latent skepticism that anything's really happening. And if you see the unhoused person on the street and you offer to buy them a sandwich, you know for sure that you helped that person. And so I think that 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 process is also running for people where they don't really believe that they're, you know, something good is happening when they just write a check overseas. And then relatedly, when you buy the person on the street a sandwich, you feel really good. Like you helped someone, you see them. I mean, they the, the person is probably like grateful and makes you feel like you're a good person. I have given money to give all recommendations for many years in a row. And I don't, I think I would probably get more warm fuzzies, you know, giving food to someone on the street than I do writing a really big check. And I always write the really big check and I, you know, cause I know that that's good, but it doesn't make me feel the same way of just, you know, helping the person in front of me. Yeah, all really good points. Okay, so the second point you made about um, why people may not give the way that you all do is that it's actually really, really hard to do, to do it well. And I think people really don't get the extent to which this is true. I mean, we've talked a bit about some of the incredibly challenging philosophical problems that come up, right? About sort of the ethics and how do you balance different ethical things? How do you figure out, you know, uh, lives saved versus well-being and things like that. We also talked a little bit about, well, what about displacing other funders? Like that's such a complicated thing to consider. And these seem like consequences that come up as soon as you start saying, we want to do this as effectively as possible. You start introducing all these really challenging things you have to solve. But one of them we haven't talked about yet is evaluating the evidence. And from my point of view, evaluating the evidence of what works seems really, really difficult. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Like, what are some of the challenges there? Yeah, let me just like walk through one example. It's going to be a little weedsy, but I think it will illustrate it really well. One of the programs we recommend is vitamin A supplementation, giving children between the ages of six months and five years a twice annual vitamin A pill. There were a bunch of like seven or so randomized trials uh, in the 80s and 90s, I believe, that showed that this program reduced child mortality by 25%. Uh, so that, that seems pretty good. That, that seems like a pretty uh, cost-effective program. Then later, a really large trial was run in India, and it included vitamin A supplementation. That trial found, if I recall correctly, zero effect of the program. Um, I think that the, again, I'm, I'm quoting this from memory, but it, so it may, some of the facts may be a little bit wrong. It's all on our website, but loosely this is going to be, you know, broadly, this is a good illustration of the challenge. I think the sample size in the India trial was about half of the total sample size from the other seven trials. It also happened 15 years later, the, the India trial. And so the question is like, what, what do you make of this evidence base now? That should we take it all as one big body of evidence and just, I don't know, reduce the effect size by half, say it was 25%, well now it's probably 12 and a half percent. Should we try to figure out whether there was something different about the underlying context of India relative to the underlying context of, you know, the, the other countries where the effects were bigger. You know, another thing we could do is we could dig in and look at the underlying characteristics of the people, the situation, the program in India relative to that, that found no effect versus the other seven that found a large effect. That could be underlying rates of vitamin A deficiency. That could be underlying rates of child mortality. It could even be how effectively the program was implemented. That was actually a big question raised about the India study was, was this program effectively distributed or were we picking up no effect because there had been program failure rather than, uh, you know, pro program delivery failure rather than program failure. Uh, and then finally, maybe you just want to say the world has changed. 
uh, you know, things, this is a sub bullet perhaps of trying to understand the underlying mechanism, uh, but maybe something else was much worse uh, 20 years earlier in the original studies that had found this big effect that had gone away. And now if we scale the program up today, we should affect a result that is more like the most recent study. And that, I mean, that's a, that we could go uh, down into each of those even further. And there's 10 other examples. Those questions, that's just like a quick sampling of what makes it hard in something like vitamin A, which in the scheme of things is probably one of the easier programs to understand because it's been evaluated in a series of eight randomized control trials. It's such a good and interesting example. And I think this is the norm, as far as I understand it, not like a weird outlier. Would you agree with that, that the, very often the evidence is very mixed? I think most often there's insufficient evidence. Uh, and so in this case, you know, I think it's, it's relatively rare to have so much evidence about a fairly straightforward program. What's more common is to have three studies of different methodological quality looking at programs that are slightly varied. And it's really hard to use that to inform program delivery. I mean, often, often the only solution or a great solution is to fund a program with additional evaluation on top of it so that we as the funder can learn from the results of the program we're supporting and scale it up further from there. Um, of course, that itself requires a huge degree of investment, time, energy, money to be able to be in a position to evaluate that going forward. So in one of the early episodes on this podcast, when I was still <laughs> figuring out how to podcast, I had on uh, Uri Bram, who talked, and we talked about GiveWell, and we talked about how the deworming interventions that you recommend that you're essentially are giving children pills to try to uh, get rid of parasitic worm infections, that it's easy for someone to think that like GiveWell is absolutely sure that these thing wor things work. But what uh, Uri was saying is that if you read carefully the, the blog post you put out about this topic, what you find out is that the GiveWell actually thinks there's like a lot of uncertainty about the effects of these programs and that the recommendation is really based more on saying, well, on average or in an expected value sense, you know, if we take the probability of different outcomes times how good those outcomes are, we think in an expected value sense, it's a really good intervention. But there's actually a huge amount of uncertainty. So I'm just wondering, like, is that a fair characterization of how you feel about their warming? Completely. I mean, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. We wrote a, my colleague, Sean, wrote a blog post that was titled, Deworming might have huge impact, but might have close to zero impact, which maybe we could have titled better, but we were trying to really hammer home this point that deworming is not a sure thing. Deworming is a great, I think, expected value bet, but, uh, Oh, gosh, I think it's more likely than not that it has relatively limited impact, you know, perfectly fine. The the real juice in deworming is the possibility of, of huge impact. Because yeah, I think people, you know, when they consider an intervention like this, they're like, wow, there are all these children. They've got parasitic worm infections. You give them some cheap pills. It kills the worms. Clearly, that's a huge benefit, right? But then you look at these studies and you're like, well, what do the studies really show? It's like they show an impact on income like a long time later. Wouldn't you expect to see an impact that's like much sooner and, and more direct rather than sort of indirect income impacts if the intervention really works? So yeah, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that aspect of it. I mean, I think you're, you're saying it exactly right. You know, you look at this deworming program and the strongest piece of evidence is a single randomized trial that found huge impact effects many years later. There is some evidence of meaningful short-term effects, most notably with weight gain, um, but nothing that is clear and decisive or what I think you would, the way you're putting it, intuitively expect to see. At the same time, we've done a lot of work to try and figure out what is going on with this study. Um, actually, there used to be a couple other studies that we would talk about that supported deworming, both um, looking at deworming programs in the American South when the Americas eliminated hookworm and then some additional retrospective studies of um, test scores in, in Africa. And for a long time, we were including those in our case for deworming, but as we kept digging in, an economist named David Rudman, uh, I think largely falsified those studies, but he did a ton of work on uh, you know, this study uh, also, and there's nothing that we can find. You know, it's, it was not a tiny study, about 3,000 children were enrolled, I believe. And you know, no, no matter the ways in which we 
poked and prodded and pulled apart, got the data, we ran it for this study, its results held up. And so we look at deworming and we say, there's a single particularly robust piece of evidence for this program. The effect is really huge. And there's this uh, t- you know, somewhat like intuitive case that you can treat a lot of children for a parasitic infection for very little money. That's a bet we're going to take, even though my like personal best guess is it's more likely than not that that program is not having such a big effect. I think it's a, such an interesting example because it sort of changes the frame that I think some people inappropriately put on GiveWell. Because I think some people think of GiveWell as, okay, what we're looking for are the things that like we can be really confident are really effective. Like, sure, there's you know tens of thousands of possible opportunities out there that you could give to, but we want the like stuff we're confident is really effective. But then when you look at something like deworming, you're like, well, but we're not confident it's really effective. What is the right framing? And I'm also interested in relating that to open philanthropy. Because like one frame on open fill is that, well, you know, give well is trying to do like the really certain stuff, right? And open fill is trying to do the like more experimental stuff that's like maybe even more scalable and like they're willing to accept, you know, higher expected value as a trade-off against like more uncertainty, right? So yeah, like where do you feel is the correct framing given these, these kind of uncertainties? And then how would you relate that to what open fill is doing? Yeah, so let me answer the, the like framing one first and, and then see if we, we move on to open fill. The correct framing for GiveWell is we're trying to maximize impact and we're working within an expected value framework. And it's that rather than, so we're going to treat 10% chance of 100 as the same as 100% chance of 10. We're not aiming at, quote, high confidence giving. We're aiming for maximizing impact, you know, within some constraints giving. Um, You know, that said, I think, to be honest, the way that people perceive us today, or or though, frankly, the way that we have allowed that perception to persist is problematic. I think it's like one of the, yeah, you know, one of the mistakes that I think we have to fix is it should be much clearer to people, you know, especially people who want high confidence giving or high confidence, high impact giving, that deworming is not that. And that's something that, you know, we aim to fix because I think we're just not doing a good job living up to our value of transparency. To defend you a little bit, you did entitle the blog post saying it might do nothing, right? So that's Well, I don't cool. think, look, I'm not trying to fall on my sword and say we're doing a terrible job, but look, you know, we aspire to be really clear. And I think this is, no, a, is a great place where there's a lot of confusion. And I think it's just a good example of somewhere where um, we know that like GiveWell has this quote brand of high confidence giving. That's something we do want to offer donors because we can, but it's not the complete view of what GiveWell is. And recently we've made even more grants that go well outside the bounds of high confidence giving in areas that are uh, like public health regulation, giving money to support efforts to uh, improve, improve the regulation of lead in low-income countries. This is definitely a risky uh, philanthropic recommendation that we're making based on an expected value calculation. And um, it's a very small amount of what we do. Uh, you know, when donors give to GiveWell's Maximum Impact Fund, it's going to give wells sort of higher confidence, top charities. But this perception that people have is, is, is off base. And I think we can do something to fix it. Wait, so if someone does want high confidence giving, which of the GiveWell recommended organizations are you most confident does good? So not maximum expected value, but maximizing like confidence that it's actually working. Yeah, so I think that, you know, for us right now, I mean, like Give Directly is the organization that I'd say is highest confidence of doing a lot of good. But, you know, in my opinion, when you give to Give Directly, by taking that confidence, you're giving a lot, you're giving up a lot in terms of expected impact. And then, you know, against Malaria Foundation with Malaria Nets, Malaria Consortium with Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention, so the two malaria organizations, and then Vitamin A Supplementation, incentives for cash incentives for childhood vaccines, we see those all as high expected value, high confidence. You know, maybe give directly is extremely high confidence, but lower expected value. And then deworming, it's actually not higher expected value than the malaria organizations. I say it's, you know, kind of in the same ballpark, but lower confidence. Uh, it, you know, so if I were pointing someone to just the higher confidence set of op, uh, organizations on our list, would be the you know malaria, vitamin A, and incentives for immunization. Got it. And give directly. You say it's like extremely high confidence that it actually does good. Is that more based on the studies of it, or is it actually more based on a priori arguments that like if you take extremely poor people and you give them money, like that that's going to benefit them substantially? 
the starting assumption that giving poor people money does a lot, but there's also a lot of evidence of different types, you know, both studies of Give Directly itself, studies of other cash programs, and also, I don't know, more qualitative analyses of how people with very low incomes manage their financial lives, all of which I think confirm in a good way the underlying assumption that by and large, very poor people use money in broadly speaking, you know, productive, beneficial ways. Do you want to form a positive new habit? Are you interested in improving your diet, learning a skill, or getting fit with daily exercise? Then you should check out the free Clearer Thinking program called Daily Ritual, a Habit Creation System. Powered by over two years of research, the Daily Ritual program teaches simple techniques that can help you form a new, beneficial daily habit. If you're motivated to make a positive change to your daily routine, these techniques may be just the thing you need to lock in your new activity. Are you ready to reshape your day? To use the free daily ritual tool or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and many courses, head to clearerthinking.org. Yeah, I think sometimes people, when they think about poor people and giving them money, they worry they're going to do things like spend it on drugs or alcohol or things like that. But it seems to me that those perspectives are really misguided, especially when you're looking at something like the global poor, where like you have whole villages where everyone's extremely poor and it's like not due at all to any deficit on their own part. It's just due to the fact that they were born in a really poor part of the world. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think one of the books that was most informative for me here is a book called Portfolios of the Poor, which is more of a like walkthrough of how people with very low incomes manage their financial lives and manage those financial lives in a very sophisticated way. And I think it would be, might surprise people whose intuitions are based on like how they perceive people who have extremely low incomes in, um, you know, say like uh, high income countries. Right. Like for example, I think in low income countries, poor people often do sort of multiple side gigs, as I understand it, where they're like making money in a whole bunch of different ways. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but I think that like in general, like people are, have to figure out how to live on extremely low incomes and, you know, balancing food, education expenses, et cetera. And, and really just like finding ways to get by, you know, an influx of cash that might amount to, you know, doubling one's annual income can make a really big difference to people who are already stretched thin and being very thoughtful about how they manage their finances. Okay. So then if we're not in the realm of like trying to maximize confidence, right? If we're in the realm of expected value maximization, one could ask, why is GiveWell not doing much weirder stuff, right? If like, if all you care about is expected value, why aren't you taking more like, you know, 1% shots at like enormous amounts of good. Or maybe you, maybe you would say that you are. But I'm curious to hear your reaction to that. I mean, to some extent, I think this is the difference between, or part of the difference between OpenFill and GiveWell. Um, you know, OpenFill now is working on global health and well-being. So there is this overlap on uh, giving to support people who are living today or in the near future in low-income countries. And you know, I think of OpenPhil as the group that is taking this explicitly hits-based giving approach, looking for opportunities that could have crazy impact that might have that 1% chance of, you know, really uh, high upside. You know, we're open to that. We're not like fundamentally opposed to that line of thinking. It's it's sort of consistent with our, our values and approach. But I think our comparative advantage is, uh, you know, being somewhere north of, uh, I don't know, 25% chance of, of impact rather than, you know, being in the sort of uh, lower likelihood, really harder to, to think through opportunities. Um, I, sh I should say, like, if we saw those opportunities, we would consider them. And, you know, there's nothing where we say, oh, like, this thing is just too weird. Give well should, you know, can't touch it because we're not allowed to. We don't feel constrained in that way. So, so we're open to it. They're just not opportunities that, that, you know, that we see. And, you know, maybe because of our underlying framework and experience are, are sort of pulled more towards the less crazy opportunities. So what would you say is really going on here? Is this about methodology diversification? It's like, well, it's good to have like one organization that's like hits based and that's like one strategy. And it's good to have one that's sort of a little more conservative in that way. Or is it more about 
some difference in sort of like maybe priors. Like maybe you think the hit space stuff, like maybe you think that a lot of stuff like seems really good at first that doesn't have a lot of evidence. And like you say, oh, maybe this has, you know, this crazy amount of impact. But in your experience, actually, that almost never pans out. And so when you're in that realm of like hits based, you know, it's usually not as good as it seems. Or yeah, I'm just wondering where this difference really lies. I think it's a combination. I think that temperamentally and culturally, more people at GiveWell have, you know, more skeptical priors. I shouldn't say more skeptical priors than anyone, but like we tend to be on the, the skeptical end of the spectrum and also on the, you know, sort of looking for searching for confidence under the spectrum. So we're, you know, we're, we're a little bit less likely to believe in the 1% chance of, you know, big impact. And so I think that's definitely part of what, you know, GiveWell is culturally today. And then if you say, well, like, why, why not change? Why, why don't you want to put more effort into increasing the scope of what GiveWell takes on? It has a lot to do with diversification. Um, you know, there's another institution that's, extremely values aligned. In large part, I think we're just trying to do the same thing. We believe in the same things in terms of, you know, what would make the world good, but we're just approaching it in different ways. GiveWell is doing deeper due diligence and focusing more on the empirical case, looking for higher confidence. You know, OpenFill is looking more for the, the hits and moving more quickly. And you know, if, if OpenFill didn't exist, it would be great to create OpenFill, but I'm really glad it exists. And, you know, they're, they're doing their thing. And so I think that diversification of methodology is a strong reason, you know, to not go further. And all that said, like, we're, we're, I think like one of the open questions for GiveWell going forward is, you know, to what extent, I, I think we are going to move over time into, you know, taking more lower confidence bets um, I'm not sure like exactly what those will look like or what direction that will take, but I think we are likely to to move more in that direction, though more slowly than open fill, because it's just not the main thing that we're focused on. I remember a number of years ago, I believe it was Holden had a blog post about how you can't just naively apply an expected value calculation, because basically if you do this, you will essentially be duped into like putting money into a whole bunch of things that like you know, imagine you look at 100 opportunities and there's some noise in your evaluation process, right? And then you just pick the three that look the best. Well, those are most likely to be the three that like have the biggest noise where your measurement was just bad and you're just buying the thing that look, had the positive luck instead of the negative luck. And so he talks about this idea of you really need to work your prior into that. And also over time, I think that you all have seen that you're Expected value ca calculations tend to go down as you get more evidence, not go up as you get more evidence, right? So I'm curious, like, did I characterize that right? And is that is that how you look at things? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. Um, and and I think the second one, especially that, in our experience, by and large, the back of the envelope cost effectiveness estimate we have after looking at a program for a week is much higher than the calculation that we make you know, three months later. And that experience is just like so invariably correct that for me, if someone says, oh, I just found this new program, uh, it's ADX cash. So ADX cash would be like eight times as good as the things we're recommending today. We pretty much never find something that that's good. I can say with high confidence that's coming down and then it does come down. And uh, that that rule is like pretty common. And I think that, that you know, I, I'm not sure that we are, Per, you know, I should say, I know we're not perfectly adjusting, but it's hard to be well calibrated on how far those will come down in every case, um, especially when, you know, the, the more familiar we everyone gets with that dynamic, the more they're trying to adjust on their own. Um, but I think that's a part of the skepticism about, you know, multiply really big number by small percentage and take it because we've just seen the dynamic of the, you know, the relatively shallow investigation uh, can lead you astray. It's so interesting that that happens. What are some of the forces that you think lead to that happening? Like, why do things seem better at first? I think there's basically infinite ways that programs can fail. And so for some reason, you know, the, the initial calculation often takes into account, it's kind of like, I'm not sure this is the right analogy, but it, it, planning fallacy seems like the right analogy where you almost imagine, you think you're taking the, the median expectation, but really you're just assuming everything goes perfectly and all it takes in your plan is for, I don't know, one person to be sick for a week. And that 
you know, that there's some chance that happens that bumps the whole timeline out. Similarly, when in a program, you know, all it takes is, uh, you know, some new thing that you learned that you didn't know about before uh, to bump it, bump it down. And over time, we continue to learn those things. Uh, I'll give like one silly, it's not silly because of the subject matter, but seems simple type of problem that we learned about. I, I mentioned earlier that about 50% of child deaths occur in the first month. And I hope that stat is correct now that I keep repeating it. And many child health programs, like immunization programs, they don't even begin until a child is older than one month. And so, you know, one might do something really simple and say, well, you know, the measles vaccine has X percent reduction in mortality, the pneumonia vaccine, Y percent reduction, and apply it to all child mortality. Of course, they couldn't have any of those effects on deaths before age of one month. And so you could just do this like simple calculation error where you apply an effect to an outcome that the, you know, couldn't possibly have the causal relationship because it happens afterwards. And that's just like one example. But I, I think for any particular program, there's like a hundred things like that that could pop up. And they tend to be on the negative side because that initial outline of the sort of quantification of the impact of the program tends to be a fairly optimistic one. Yeah, that's so well said. And it really jives with what I think is true about doing good, which is that doing good is very brittle. Like you don't do massive amounts of good by accident, you know, unless you're extremely, extremely lucky and you don't do it with the moderate amount of planning, unless you're really, really lucky. It's like you have to like set all of these different variables into place just right. And so I think about this program where they were trying to get people to put, uh, I think it was like chlorine in their drinking water because the drinking water is like contaminated. You know, and if, and if you were to pitch this program, you're like, ah, well, look, people are drinking this contaminated water. We know chlorine, you know, kills the germs in it. All we have to do is like put these chlorine dispensers at the drinking wells and then people won't get sick. Boom, slam dunk, right? But then you actually like learn about the things they went through to get this program to work. Like, for example, when they, when they installed these things, like people just weren't using the chlorine, right? And then they were like finding all these things like, well, even if people were using the chlorine, if the chlorine dispensers like ran out of chlorine, then people would just stop using them and then they would refill them, but then people wouldn't start using them again. Like, I guess, cause they would just like fall out of the habit or maybe they like no longer knew there was chlorine. So it was just like, it was just the crazy amount of effort to like make that simple seeming plan actually work. Because in fact, that plan has about like 50 hidden steps that you don't think about when you first just describe it, right? So I don't know, does that sound like uh, I'm describing the same thing that you did? Yeah, I think that's right. Like, just imagine there's 50 things, all of which have to go right to achieve impact. When And when someone does their quick back of the envelope calculation, they just assume that all those 50 happened. And you can think, oh, maybe I should haircut that a little bit, but you have no idea how. But all it takes is any one of those 50 sort of yes switches to flip to no, and it demolishes the impact. Right. Like, I mean, in this case, it could be, well, maybe chlorine doesn't kill the type of bacteria that they're that the people are getting sick from, right? Or, you know, you could just think of so many like weird and wacky ways that like this could fail. And each one of those is probably not going to be the reason it fails, but there's so many of them that they kind of stack up and then, you know, things, <laughs> things don't actually work. So yeah, I think, I think the thing that's somewhat, I'm not totally sure I understand, but it's somewhat surprising is that we're, you know, you find there's all these things that have to go right to have the impact, but why aren't there you know, other surprises that are positive. Like, why, why aren't those there? And I think it could be that they don't exist. And it also could be that we're missing them. You know, one of the things we sometimes think about in recommendations we make is what we might call unmodeled upside. You know, good things that could happen because of this grant that we're not including in the cost effectiveness analysis. And I think it is possible that if, you know, if I'm wrong about this, the way I'd be wrong is we just don't look for upside after the fact, we don't really think about it. It feels like this extra thing we don't care about. And so therefore we don't find it. But my guess is that if what you were looking for was sort of upside, you might want to go about your work in a very different way than what GiveWell does. You know, you'd be, I don't know, you'd find, you, you might do something that looks more like what VCs do when they're investing in lots of really small things that could get really, really huge. And therefore in the type of work that GiveWell does, it actually is more likely that the finding one of those 50 things that stands in the way of impact is significantly more likely than uh, some really surprisingly good thing happening that magnifies the impact of the program. So maybe there's a kind of entropy argument here where if you're talking about preventing some specific bad outcome or creating some specific positive outcome, you need things to align just right. It's sort of like 
you know, clocks don't assemble themselves by chance just by throwing together a bunch of parts, right? So maybe it's like the strong default is that like no change occurs and like almost all configurations of things, no change occurs. And to get that change, maybe you need things just perfectly aligned. And if that were true, it could help explain why you don't get these like sort of unexpected upsides that often. But you often do get the unexpected downside because the unexpected downside is often just nothing happened, right? Which is sort of the default anyway. I think that's right. Um, and even when I think about our current recommendations, you know, we talked about deworming for a bit. It's not out of the realm of possibility that at some point in the future, we'll learn something that helps us understand the mechanism through which the effect in that original trial took place. You know, I don't know. We learned that someone went around and to, to be clear, this is totally speculative, made up, not something I believe, but the type of thing we could learn. Someone went around and, you know, tutored all the kids in the treatment villages because they really wanted them to succeed. And it's hard to imagine something coming out on the other side that, you know, made the effect size look even larger than we think it is today. How do you think about second order effects, right? So like, you know, you give children uh, deworming pills and, you know, okay, so maybe now they don't have parasitic worms, which maybe means they have like all of these different potential benefits, like maybe they're not as tired or maybe they, you know, better cognitive processing or whatever. I actually have no idea what kind of effects the worms have on people, but you can imagine there's a lot of different things. And then, you know, you find, you know, years later, you find they have higher incomes, but you could imagine second order effects or third order effects or fourth order effects of like, well, if they have higher incomes, maybe that positively affects people in the village that are not even in the treatment group, or maybe... It causes, uh, you know, their children to be more likely to survive and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think this is a really challenging question and relates to discussion we were having about the extent to which, like, the enterprise of trying to estimate cost effectiveness is, like, how well it works. You know, what's knowable and what's ultimately unknowable. I think, like, the way that I see it now is that, you know, there's just a limit to how far you can take cost effectiveness analysis. And in, in some ways, you have to just decide how far you're willing to go to model things out to second order effects, third order, order effects, et cetera. And it's really hard because the motivation to go further is very strong because you're like, I'm missing something that matters to the case for this opportunity. I want to capture everything. On the other hand, practically speaking, the further you go, the more complex your model becomes and the harder, it, the harder it is to understand and the more likely you do something wrong. And so I think that, you know, like the, the approach that we aim to take is to say, we see this model in our estimates effectively as a tool for ordering the potential opportunities that exist in the world. And then we want to like fill them in from top down. And in using that tool, we want to apply it in the most practically useful way. Often that means like not going too far, because if we go too far, it will no longer be practically useful. Um, even though we, we know that we're giving up some quote, like truth by not taking the, the model further to those, you know, second or third order effects. Uh, and then we're using it, um, yeah, in, in this way as a tool. I, I think that what, what can be exceptionally challenging is when it seems like the second order effect overwhelms the first, the first order, and you really need to take it into account in order to see, you know, the full effect of the, the programming on the world. And, and, you know, that's a, that's a real challenge for us. Do you think it's a reasonable heuristic to say that usually the more degrees out you go, the less large the effect is, like the second order is smaller than the first order and third order even smaller. And so that usually it's kind of okay to neglect the higher order effects? Like usually that, that has been, I mean, that's been our experience most of the time. You know, there are some exceptions. So you know, again, I don't have the number at my fingertips, but roughly speaking, when we recommend malaria organizations, we think about half of the money we're directing is displacing money that would have gone to that intervention and now goes somewhere else. So that's sort of a second order effect, but man, it's a pretty big one. It's 50%. Similarly, malaria causes severe childhood illness. And there's a pretty substantial body of you know, different types of evidence. Deworming is one piece, but, but much you know, others as well from malnutrition and other places that health and wellness in early childhood supports li improved life outcomes. And therefore, about a third, I think, of the impact estimate that we make for malaria programs comes from what we call developmental effects. And you could call that a second order effect. It's definitely like a loose estimate, but it's something that is a pretty big deal. You know, all that said, there's a lot of other things that we consider. Those are, those are the two examples that come to mind that are the biggest. 
There's a lot of really small ones, you know, the, the burden of disease for malaria or lost economic opportunity, averted treatment costs and et cetera, you know, uh, that are benefits of a malaria program, you know, all of which are pretty small. And, you know, we do try to explicitly go through these and say, do we think this would be a really big effect? If yes, let's look at it. If not, at least try to, you know, be explicit. And we have this in our model about the fact that we don't think it's that big. Here's the effect that we added. And then, you know, not put a lot of time and energy into trying to specify it precisely. On a slightly different topic, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on the average charity, right? So like, let's say I were to go to one of these charity recommendation systems like Charity Navigator or GuideStar and just like literally just pick at random, right? And I give money at random to these charities, like, you know, I give $100 to each of them at random. What sort of distribution of impact would you expect to see? Like, would you expect to see, for example, more like a normal distribution, you know, where a lot of things are kind of in the middle? Or would you expect to see more like a power law where like a few of those $100 donations like go much, much further and help people much, much more than the others? The charitable universe is so broad that maybe it helps to just home in on organizations trying to help, you know, the very poor. Sure. Let's, let's, fo- let's focus on that because you also have more experience around that. So let's you say- know, Instead of trying to think about, in, you know, yeah. what does, mm-hmm. you know, a donation to, uh, you know, Harvard University do, let's say. Within like helping the very poor, I mean, I think my best guess is that, yeah, like there, there is something where the, you know, the, the, the very best organizations are kind of like having this massively outsized effect because, you know, even within, like, like when I think about GiveWell, you know, we've been looking for this for, for many, many years. Like the, the sort of very best dollars we recommended in 2021, we probably spent at 50x or so. There's a very small amount of money that we can spend at that level. So 50x referring to 50x giving cash, like 50 times. Yes, yeah, so, so 50 times, times as good as giving cash. And then our like last dollar was spent at around 8x. And then, you know, there's give directly at 1x. And then I was just comparing give directly to sort of average US based charity. I don't know, like the, you know, I think the median income in sub Saharan Africa is about 100 times lower than the median income in the United States. So you might assume that like give directly is 100 times better um, in some, you know, if you're just increasing someone's ability to earn money than the average, you know, US based charity. And so I think like even within the, so, so when you look at like the GiveWell universe and then sort of expand it out and, and try to do that like quick and dirty give directly to other comparison, you can see how many multiples there are separating sort of like average US from, you know, top of like the, the GiveWell list. That's a really interesting way to think about it. So if we're thinking about the relative impact of giving a dollar to someone who has a hundred times higher income compared to someone who has like, you know, 100 that income, how much more beneficial is that? Because I assume it's not just linear, right? It's not like it actually helps them 100 times more, or does it? Do you think it is linear? I, don't, I mean, I think like a loose working assumption is it helps them about 100 times more. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to stand, I don't, I don't know for sure that, that that's like where the, the, the math will come out exactly, but I think it would be like roughly that. You know, basically increasing someone's income by 10% does about the same amount of good in both cases. So giving $100 to someone who has a $100 annual income, that's doubling their income and giving $100 to someone who has a, you know, $10,000 annual income, well, you're only increasing their income by, you know, 1%. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. It like really puts into highlight why you might get a sort of power law effect, right? Even just from like, where in the world they're giving the money, you could get this enormous difference. So if we again, think about randomly sampling charities in, let's say in the, you know, poverty reduction space or giving giving to the very poor. So if you think about the average charity that's trying to help people in the developing world, do you think the most common thing is that the charity just helps a little bit? Or do you think it's actually maybe really common that charities don't help at all or like they essentially have zero effect? So, I mean, I'd say like most often they're helping a little bit. They're helping some. Um, I'm sure it's like very frequent that they're not helping at all or even causing harm. But like, I don't think that is, that would not be my guess about the most common outcome. And I don't know like what the average effect is, um, you know, of the sort of randomly chosen charity. And I'm not even entirely sure how to go about thinking about that because it's so hard to completely understand what they're doing. And so the heuristic that I use is I say, give directly seems really great overall. 
in terms of the impact they're achieving. There's a lot of reason to believe that cash is really great to, you know, to give to someone to allow them. And so I would just by default assume, you know, but in a hand wavy way that the average organization is not accomplishing like that amount of good because that's a pretty high amount of good. But, you know, far from sure about how to even, you know, reason through that or how to estimate you know, whether it's like closer to 0.9 or 0.1 or, or 0.01, I, I really don't know. Because I tend to think that good is doing good is like very brittle and there, that has all these different ways it could fail, very similar to what you were saying before. It makes me suspect that actually a substantial percentage of charities don't do good at all. Like it wouldn't shock me if half of charities like don't do any good or, you know, do so little good that it's like essentially rounding error that can be ignored. Because I think there's so many ways that they can like get close to doing good, but then, ah, that, you know, step 37 doesn't work and <laughs> the whole thing just doesn't go through. So I suspect that that brittleness model implies something like a lot of them do nothing. Yeah. So I don't have the same, I have like a little bit of a different intuition. Um, I think a lot of the brittleness affects the magnitude of good more than like the accomplishment of any meaningful good. So to even go back to the example you brought up, you know, about like chlorination. Well, maybe the chlorine doesn't, you know, hit the right bacteria, but I don't know. Like, I'm pretty sure that drinking cleaner water is better in some way. Now, uh, is it a rounding error? I'm not sure. Um, you know, and, and not to use that as like a specific example. I, you know, it's hard to think about the rounding error, but a lot of, I think another thing that's going on is, you know, needs are so great in many parts of the world that some pretty basic, programming does some good. So, so what are some of those things? You know, digging wells, you know, a lot, a lot has been written about the extent to which like digging wells is insufficient, may not solve the problems, you know, infrastructure can go into disrepair. Uh, but also like you dig a well near someone's village so they don't have to walk as far. Like I would count that as meaningful good, not rounding error. Similarly, um, you know, organizations that, you know, another common thing, donate medical supplies. There's a lot of ways that donating those medical supplies are not doing nearly as much good as one might imagine if you kind of think about the best case scenario. But bringing basic medical supplies to highly resource constrained settings, you know, doing some good. Um, I'm not sure how much of this like difference in intuition is just around like what counts as a rounding error versus what counts as meaningful. Um, but sort of like my very qualitative intuition is that it's more on the side of, you know, meaningful good, but far less than could be accomplished if optimized rather than uh, rounding error. Yeah, in those examples you gave, I would agree with you. But I would say those seem like already unusually impactful, like from the get-go. If you're already, when you're talking about putting chlorine in people's drinking water, that's like polluted drinking water, or you're talking about digging wells in areas where people have to walk a long way, those seem like, oh, okay, yeah, that actually, you're like, that's like significantly better than average. A lot of charities that I see, and maybe these don't even come across your radar though, but like a lot of the ones I see are more like, we're going to go retrain these people for like a different type of work because they're struggling in this current kind of work. Or I guess things that are like in the helping in wealthier countries where that like the impact is much more indirect and it feels like there are many more steps to explain like how it goes from like what they're doing to like the world being better, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I'm just realizing like, I think two of the things that I really don't have any, I'm completely ignorant about, you know, notwithstanding all the time I've spent in this work over many years is what the average charity does, like literally the average, because I just don't spend like any attention on, on, you know, what the, I don't know if you had a list of a thousand charities, what like number 500 does. But I think what I might be having more of my intuition driven by is like where the, the median dollar is spent, where the, you know, the biggest organizations are, you know, capturing like a larger amount of the total dollars to be totally transparent. I, I also don't know exactly how you know those dollars are spent. But I think some of the intuitions about the types of programs that are being run probably comes from being like more familiar with some of those really large institutions that are doing some of these like basic provision of basic needs. Okay, yeah, th that makes a lot of sense. So I'm just, I just went on the Charity Navigator website, right? And they have this thing called the 10 most followed charities, right? So this gives us some idea of like, you know, there's most followed, doesn't mean they're most donated to, but it probably is pretty well correlated with people donate to. So the first one, the number one ranked is Doctors Without Borders. Do you know about them or how they operate? Yeah, and I would say like they're in, I don't know, in my loose opinion, like good, you know, on the, on the good side, you know, providing like basic medical services to people who need it. 
All right, great. And then, okay, so I imagine you probably say, okay, compared to, you know, give directly, they're probably not that cost effective, but like they're definitely on the good side, not like doing nothing, right? Yeah, I don't know. I think they're a hard one. Like, how are they compared to give directly in terms of cost effectiveness? Like, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think that like basic healthcare is really great. I know relatively little about Doctors Without Borders, but I wouldn't be shocked if Doctors Without Borders like surpassed that 1x bar. Like that would not be like a shocking outcome of deep right. analysis. But but it, I suppose it just might be hard to evaluate and that's why- It would be very hard to evaluate. Yeah, it's very hard to evaluate, right? So that's like, that's why it's not on the Gibble recommended list. Okay, what about American Red Cross? That's number two. I really don't know about what they do. Well, they're, I think they're just like a massive organization, right? They probably do like so many different things. Yeah, I mean, you know, you see them in responses to natural disasters and also do blood drives and things in, you know, the US. But I, I mean, I think like one of the strange things about the charity world, like when people got started, we went through like multiple versions of believing we could do the equivalent of like, look at the company's financial statements and figure out what they're doing and like where they're, you know, you, you can look at a company statement and say, where's the profit coming from? You can't really figure out where the impact is coming from or what the most important things are that organizations do. And so I, I think one of the most surprising things about the charity world to me looking back now is how hard it is to understand very basic, you're asking like very basic logical questions. What does the American Red Cross do? How good do you think it is? And the answer of like, I really don't know. Uh, I wouldn't give there, I'd give somewhere else is like the best I can do rather than like some loose guess about, um, you, know, I, you know, how good it is relative to other things. Right, and, and my understanding is, I mean, it literally might take hundreds of hours from someone extremely experienced to really wrap their mind around like one charity and like what it does and even have a reasonable ballpark of its effectiveness. I mean, and a lot of time from the charity too. Like the, mm. you know, it's not only the, the researcher would need to spend the time, but the information isn't publicly available. Uh, and so therefore, to understand a charity's impact would require a lot of time and then a lot of participation from the charity. And then, and then you could come up with something for sure. And some people might be surprised by that because they might think, well, I mean, doesn't the charity track this information that's necessary? Like, why does it take so much time? You know, they already have a report that they give to their donors. So is it just that the information they track is just not the information you need to figure out how effective they are? very often information is tracked at like a project level rather than the aggregate level. So if you want to know what the American Red Cross does, I would be surprised if there were some report that was like, here's our overall impact in anything approaching a sort of technical way. I'm sure they have an annual report. I mean, every charity has an annual report that talks about impact. But um, I mean, that frankly is more marketing than evaluation. And very, 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 very rarely will there be an organization that has, you know, an aggregate report that is trying to approach like a technical evaluation of impact. Two exceptions that I remember from Google's very early days are the Carter Center and Population Services International or PSI. One of the reasons we were real attracted to them back in 2007, 2008, 2009 is they were the only organizations we found that were doing that. Um, Doctors Without Borders is one of the organizations that, that tries to do the same thing, you know, sort of a approaching technical, detailed articulation of impact. When organizations have a more detailed technical articulation of impact, it tends to be project-based. So you might have an organization, I won't even name an organization, big international NGO, billion dollar budget. They might have a lot of semi-technical reports uh, for $5 million projects. So no one is like adding that up into an aggregate. And then finally, the underlying methodology for the semi-technical report is still insufficient to really know what the impact is because, you know, it doesn't address questions like what's the counterfactual or, you know, might report outputs like number of wells dug without giving sufficient information to understand what was the impact of those wells, to what extent did it provide cleaner water, shorter travel time, you know, et cetera. And um, that, that, that's all missing. And I'd say like there's been multiple points in GiveWell where done things, ask charities for applications, talk to a lot of charities, uh, dig through charities' websites. I spent a whole week of my life in 2009 uh, poking through 300 charities' websites. And you know, so I, I don't know, know from experience how limited the information is that you can find there that would help you a answer this question. It suggests that that information doesn't really matter to donors very much because presumably if donors were demanding it, they would have it. And it's more around, okay, we need to tell 
a story that donors feel really good about. We need to point to maybe some numbers, but they're not necessarily impact numbers. They're like just numbers that make a donor feel like we're doing real work or, or something along those lines. I actually think there's like some underlying dynamics that are operating here. It is the case that when organizations are funded by many small donors, so say like a big organization like Save the Children gets a lot of money from people giving a hundred bucks a pop. Those donors are not looking for or demanding this sort of information. And so therefore, Save the Children doesn't need to provide it. Another thing that happens is organizations will be supported by really large institutional funders. Those could be the U.S. government. Uh, it could be the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Those funders are demanding reporting, but it's largely for the projects they support. And so if the Gates Foundation or if the U.S. government gives Save the Children money for a project, what they want is reporting on that particular project, and they want reporting that meets the criteria that the U.S. government has. And they have, you know, some of, some of their focus is on maximizing impact. And then there's also other criteria that they're looking for that matter to them that flows into their reporting. But, you know, they're not asking for uh, reporting on the entity as a whole. I think the final challenge is this is even a challenge for us. And, and I think even for a very impact aligned, well-meaning donor is not wanting to ask organizations for too much, meaning it's very helpful and necessary to have some degree of monitoring information and evidence so you can decide whether to keep giving. At the same time, charities tend to be understaffed and you know every dollar spent on evaluation means fewer dollars spent on programming. Uh, from my perspective, I think there should be a lot more spent on evaluation because I think it's really worth it, especially over the long run, to understand how all well programs are working. But I don't think it's obvious that I'm correct. And I think there's a lot of people who would say uh, the needs are so great, we just need to pour more money into programming. And, you know, I, like, like I said, I think they're wrong, but I think there's like certainly a good discussion to be had. And I think that also plays into the reticence of donors to push on better evaluation materials. Insofar as the effectiveness of charities tends to be power law distributed as opposed to normally distributed, it seems like that would actually push towards the value of collecting evidence more and more, right? Because you can't just like, hope to get lucky, you like, if you actually hi get higher quality evidence, you can find things that are like 20x or 30x or 100x better, and th that would be worth it. Whereas if most things were like around the same amount of good, and then maybe uh, collecting that extra evidence wouldn't be worth it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think you're right. I think an intuition that is common is most charities are doing about the same amount of good as each other. So therefore, what are we doing? Why collect evidence? Because it won't make a difference. It's not worth it. The underlying principle of GiveWell's or assumption is that there are these large differences and then evidence collection can make a big difference. So I'm repeating what you said, but I, I fully agree. If you're like me, you'd really like to learn quick, practical tips for improving your life or understanding the world. But it's hard to know where to look, and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the flood of blogs, media sites, and academic papers. Well, there's good news. Once a week, we send out a newsletter called One Helpful Idea, where we distill down a single idea that we think you'll find to be valuable. We know you're busy, so each idea is formatted to be read in just 30 seconds. And at the bottom of the newsletter, we also include links to that week's new podcast episodes, which is a great way to keep up with the podcast. And we include, in each email, a newly released essay by Spencer. So if you only listen to our podcast, you're missing out on a lot of our content. To sign up for the One Helpful Idea newsletter and start receiving bite-sized ideas once a week, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com slash newsletter. I'm realizing a kind of interesting contradiction here, which is in venture capital investing, it's widely accepted that there's sort of a power law of startup returns, right? So something like 90% of startups are going to go out of business or not make money for their investors. But then occasionally you're going to have that huge win that's up like 100x or maybe even 1000x. And that's going to kind of make up for all the losses from all the others. And so this kind of power law phenomenon pushes venture capitalists to say, well, the thing I really don't want to do is miss the next Google. 
So it's fine to buy a lot of duds. I want to like spread out my portfolio across things. You know, sure, I want to eliminate things that are definitely not going to be the next Google. But the really thing I don't want to do is miss out on that 100x in my portfolio. That's what I got to achieve. So there's maybe a bit of a more like spraying approach, right? So it's interesting contradiction because if there really is something like a power law in charity results, you might think, well, maybe that actually means we should be spreading out the money and create a whole portfolio because like all that matters is that we don't miss you know, those like 1,000x effectiveness charities rather than, uh, you know, if we concentrate too much, maybe we actually will end up missing them. So yeah, I'm just wondering like, what's going on there? <laughs> I'm actually kind of confused about it. So I think the biggest challenge with spreading out funds is that it's difficult to know which programs succeeded. So in venture capital, you know which company became Google because it became Google. The, like, the company is literally worth a huge amount of money now, and that was your goal uh, as a VC to uh, get that return. And in charity, your goal is to have impact, but it's very hard to know whether you have, impact, have had impact. And the only way to know whether or not you've had impact is by ultimately conducting some sort of evaluation that demonstrates that this impact occurred in the world. And so this is honestly like one of the big challenges GiveWell faces today. I wish we were in a place where we could, you know, GiveWell raises a lot of money and now and has the ability to give away a lot of money. We are not risk averse. We're well ready to make mistakes. I would love it if we could give a million dollars to 25 things, uh, you know, or more and just, you know, see the ones that let, let a, you know, 25 flowers bloom and then support the ones that succeed the most over time. The key challenge is knowing after the fact, which of those succeeded in reality. It's, it's of course hard to pr predict ex ante, but the, the challenge here is you can't even tell after the fact which one had the impact without doing a lot of work to assess it. Yeah, it's such an interesting point. But I still feel like it doesn't fully address this idea of like, well, okay, maybe you can't know how much good you've done, like a VC that can know how much money they've made after the fact. But maybe if you just kind of allocate randomly, as long as you're avoiding areas where it's very, very unlikely to have like kind of really, really good effectiveness, right? So maybe you want to, you know, avoid the things that are like definitely not effective, but then maybe among the things that could be really effective, you just kind of let a thousand flowers bloom. If we really are in this power law world, shouldn't that get pretty good returns? Because uh, that one that's a thousand times more effective than average, it's going to make up for a lot of the duds. We'd have to work through the math, but if you take a hundred things and you give a million dollars to each one, and let's say one of them is a thousand times more effective than average. In order to really access that impact, you have to keep funding that one in a hundred. But in our world, we don't know which of those one in a hundred we have to keep funding. We have no way of distinguishing between the hundred. So we just have to equally spread across all the hundred. Um, right. So sure, surely it would be better if you could, like, you know, some VCs, as some of their startups are taking off, they'll put more and more money into that one, right? And I think that's what you're getting at. It's sort of that model of like- Well, and I'd say like in the charity, it's actually necessary to keep putting money in because they can't grow without you putting more money in. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I feel like it fully it doesn't fully resolve the contradiction because there are startup VCs that only invest in seed rounds, right? They just, every you know year, they're investing a new batch of startups and mostly they're failing, but occasionally they give such big returns that the fund is still doing great. I, I'm not saying this is as effective as what you're doing. You know, I don't think it is. It's just a it kind of fascinating idea that like, if we really are in a power law world, maybe actually it's not that dumb to just pick an area where you know you've eliminated a lot of like really dumb stuff and then just kind of spread money around. And maybe it's like not as far from efficient as, as one might think because that's sort of the nature of power laws. That being said, it might also depend on the parameters of the power law, right? Like if it wasn't one in 10 startups that succeeded, if it was one in 100, maybe just spreading money around among reasonable startups would be actually be a terrible idea, right? So maybe it actually depends on sort of the dynamics of like how rare or how hard to find are these like a thousand X opportunities. Yeah, it's like how rare are they? How outsized is the impact? And then how likely are they to keep getting funded? You know, one fact about being, I don't know, like an early stage funder in the VC world is there is someone else that wants to pick up the program and take it forward. I think aiming to get someone else to take over the funding needs for a program is a goal of many funders. They imagine that, you know, either the, uh, a country government 
like the government, the government of Nigeria could take over the funding of a program in Nigeria or a large aid agency like the U.S. government could take over funding. And I think in that world, this I, I could see how this strategy would be very effective if you could fund a lot of things, some of which will be very good. And then, you know, they get picked up. I, I still think the big challenge is no one has a mechanism for determining which ones are worth continuing. And that seems like the biggest difference between the VC analogy and the charitable sector analogy is like we we don't know which ones to stop funding. And what made Google Google or what enabled Google to be Google was the recognition that it was succeeding over time. And then it continued to be able to gain funding because of that success to continue to grow at scale. It seems like in the charity world, it's a lot easier to delude yourself for a really long time because you never are forced to deal with the feedback that it's not working. Yeah, I think there's a decided lack of inarguable evidence about the impact you're having or not having. Okay, so before we wrap up, I want to do like a rapid fire round or just ask you a bunch of questions and get your like quick response. How does that sound? Yeah, how quick? <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> but um, okay, so first question for you. Suppose that you were not allowed to give to any giveaway recommended charities. How would you decide what to give to? Like, how would you approach it? Just and, and suppose you're not allowed to, your answer is not allowed to be like, oh, I go spend a year investigating. You know, it's just like you have to make a reasonably quick decision. Uh, well, I'd cheat. I would just give to Open Phil. Ah, do they accept money? I don't know. I, I, I just <laughs> write them a check. I don't know. I'd, I'd come up with something. Okay. <laughs> it's okay if you don't have an answer beyond that, but I'm curious if you have a... Any but, I mean, just outside yeah. the bounds of what should I should I give my answer? I mean, I think if I was saying... Well, let's know, say what, someone's not going to yeah. give to a give all charity, right? They're not going to give to Open Phil. What should they think about in terms of how to decide where to give? The the biggest things I'd be thinking about are, are like, what do I... Could I potentially disagree with Gibble and Open Phil about? That could be, you know, things about moral values. We talked a little bit about that earlier on. And it could also be strategies that someone can undertake that like give all or open fill might not. And I think the best advantage a regular person has is the people they know and like the small funding needs that people they know have. Um, you know, give well is not looking at every $10,000 funding opportunity that exists. And certainly like we don't, you know, it, when you know someone really well, you may believe in them in a way that you couldn't believe in something that's further away. You know, obviously Gibble got a lot of help uh, in that way when we got our initial funding from people who knew Holden and me really well and therefore was willing to take a bet on us. So one way to think about charitable giving is breaking it into sort of the sector or area you're giving the money to. And then from there, the specific charity in that in that area, right? So it's like, okay, if you're trying to help, you know, poor people, you know, that's like the area. And then you could say, okay, now which charity to help poor people? And I'm wondering if you had to like break down the impact, like how much of the impact just comes from like the focus, like, oh, we're going to focus on the poorest people in the world. And how much additional impact do you think you get from like choosing the specific charity within that realm? I mean, I would go back to that math we did before. So I think a huge amount of the impact comes from choosing to help some of the poorest people in the world. You know, maybe that's moving you from getting you like 100 times the impact you'd get of just helping like average person, you know, average poor person in America. Um, and then, you know, the choosing the best thing there, you know, also can sort of differ maybe, you know, at the current margin by a factor of 10. So, yeah, I don't know. You factor of 100 by choosing the poorest people in the world and an additional factor of 10 by choosing the, the best things available at the current margin. So, so that suggests that if people couldn't give to give, give well charities, one thing they could do is just try to find things in the same ballpark area of like, you know, you're already in the realm of helping the poorest people in the world, something like that, and then just look for other charities, and that and that could still be pretty good. Yeah, that seems right. Okay, what what are the views of sort of you and GiveWell on helping animals? Um, I think it'll just be easier for me to speak for myself, which is um, animals deserve like significant moral weight. I know I wrote some things like when I was younger that that you know I, I disavow now about um, you know not taking animal welfare seriously. You know, I, I do take it seriously, and. The reason GiveWell is not looking into animal welfare is, is I don't think we have comparative advantage over what the farm animal welfare team at Open Phil and animal charity evaluators are doing. That's not something we've like looked into super deeply, but I would just guess that we don't have a lot of impact or a lot of uh, value to add above them relative to us doing more in international giving. Do you think that most really good giving opportunities are already fully funded? In other words, like if you were to take the set of stuff that's like highly effective, you know, is it like the vast majority of it's already funded? And so then you have to look really carefully for like the underfunded stuff. Or do you think there's actually it's actually not the case and that like stuff that's really effective is not especially likely to be funded? So I think there's still a lot of stuff that's like really excellent that's not funded. Um, but but I also think 
that you have to define what you mean by by good. And, and, and here, I'd want to do something quantitative. So when I think about, you know, we've been talking in the Zell Gibwell talks where we put a threshold of cost effectiveness on things as multiples of cash transfers. And I've been looking a lot recently for things that are eight times or better than cash transfers. Um, but if we instead were looking for things that are only half as good, four times or better than cash transfers, there is a ton of opportunity there that we haven't looked at that exists that is um, underfunded. So, you know, on one hand, I think there probably is uh, just lower confidence, higher risk, higher upside stuff that exists in the world that we that we and others haven't looked at yet and found. Um, but when you think about like, is the good stuff funded, it depends heavily on, you know, what your threshold for cost effectiveness is. So would you say that there's sort of an exponential drop off or even super exponential drop off? Like as you go from 1x to 2x to 3x to 4x, like you're getting just a extremely fast diminishing number of opportunities? I mean, that's our best guess, but based on very loose analysis that, you know, or, or maybe put differently, I, I would say it the opposite way. As you go down the cost effectiveness curve, the available set of opportunities opens, you know, gets gets like very, very, very large and it's larger, like, you know, sort of like an exponential curve as you go down where it gets larger and larger as you go down that curve, you know, all the way down to give directly where, you know, that sort of like unlimited capacity to give money to people who are like much poorer than you or I. And as you give more and more, people's incomes go up and the, you know, the marginal value goes down, but there's effectively like unlimited opportunity to give money to extremely poor people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's, that's also consistent with the kind of the loosely speaking with the power law. If we're not too precise about it. So this is a more personal question. You have in your life helped just an insanely large number of people an insanely large amount. Like, you know, if you hadn't been born, there would just be a hell of a lot of people that'd be much worse off than they are. And I'm wondering, like, do you feel that on a visceral level? Like, do you think about that? Like, how do you relate to that? I'm not sure it's true. Um, I think that something like, you know, co-founded GiveWell and the effect of, you know, Toby and Will were starting giving what we can at the same time that Holden and I were starting GiveWell. Peter Singer was writing a lot about effective altruism. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to think about like the literal marginal contribution that I made. Um, but I, I'd say that, you know, honestly, I am really proud of the work that I get to do and feel really lucky that, you know, I get to do something every day that is challenging. Um, it's fun. And when I step back and I say, like, what is it I'm spending my time on? You know, when my kids are asking me, you know, why are you working? Like, why aren't you playing with us? I can explain what I'm doing. And I feel really proud of the work that, that I get to do and that Gibble does to, to try and help people. Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining a nightmare scenario where your kids are like, oh, no, if he plays with us, another 10 children are going to die somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not very compelling for them. For some <laughs> so I, I wonder about cases where... GiveWell has sort of changed its mind on charities and what the sort of most common scenarios are. Like when you change your mind, when you think something looks really good and then later you decide it's not, you know, we've already talked about this a bit. Is it usually because you discover some new fact about them that you didn't know before? Or do you often find that charities actually change what they're doing? And like, or is it more that they just like, they are at capacity now and they used to be really good, but now they just can't use money effectively? God, there's so many reasons. I think probably the most common one is new piece of factual information. We recommend an organization called No Lean Season on the base, basis of evidence that showed that incentivizing migration from uh, rural areas of Bangladesh to urban areas during the lean season when there was no work in rural areas led to large increases in income, funded the creation of that organization, also funded additional evidence generation. And that additional evidence showed that uh, you know, in, in multiple runs wasn't increasing incomes. The, the program was not increasing people's incomes. And so that, you know, we that, that caused us to change our mind. And there's a lot of examples like that of opportunities we've recommended or opportunities we haven't we haven't yet recommended that have caused us to change our mind. Other things that, you know, lead us to change our, our view, to some extent there's, you know, we also talked about moral weights. So GiveWell's, as I said, GiveWell's views of the relative I don't know, philosophical value of health relative to income has shifted over time with us putting more weight on health. And that's shifted the you know, allocation of funding, but also the, the priority we give health programs relative to income generating programs. And then finally, there's just, you know, changes to GiveWell's situation. You know, as GiveWell, you know, a, a couple of years ago, we would have said, you know, we're only going to fund programs that are above 10x 
cash. That's as a cost of action threshold. But as GiveWells raise more money, you know, we just think we should go down further, further down the curve. That's not a change of, of mind as much as it's a, um, you know, change in, in circumstance. But there's a million other, other examples, including organizations that have changed how they operate uh, in order to be, you know, sort of to, to make us more confident in them. And a really early example is uh, the Against Malaria Foundation, which we looked at first in 2008. And at the time, they were doing very limited monitoring after they distributed malaria nets. And we said, hey, you know, this is what's really holding up our recommendation. And after that, they started doing um, post-distribution surveys. And, uh, you know, after that, we, we started recommending them. So we've also had the ability to influence organizations and, and help them operate in what ways we think are better. Would you consider funding new projects? Because as far as I can tell, that's not something GiveWell has done. You're, you're looking for existing projects. And if not, I'm wondering what the thinking is there. Just because obviously you're not going to have a, a wide evidence base on new projects. But with new projects, you could have a lot of influence and for like a small amount of money, cause something to exist that may not have otherwise. Yeah, we've done a fair amount actually of, of funding of new projects, a little bit buried in our website. You know, we funded an organization oh, I didn't called that. Hmm. New Incentives that's now a Give Well Top Charity. This was, you know, gave them $100,000 to start up in 2014. I mentioned No Lean Season. You know, we got them off the ground. Then additional evidence shut them, they shut down. Uh, Fortify Health and uh, Charity Science Health are organizations that kind of came out of the EA community, starting programs on iron fortification and SMS uh, reminders for immunization in India have, have supported those. I think we probably will do even more of this over time. The current reason we're not doing more is limited capacity. Uh, you know, our big institutional or strategic objective, strategic challenge is finding great ways to give away a huge amount of money. You know, we think we might have to, we might be in a position to direct as much as a billion dollars by 2025. And really small organizations tend to have very small budgets and are not getting as close. We, we think we ultimately will have more impact in the very near term by giving to more established organizations that are able to help more people more effectively, more quickly. Um, but we've also had some success hiring recently. You know, that's a big thing. We're, we're aiming to hire more uh, senior researchers who are helping to sort of be the intellectual leaders of our team. And as we do, we're able to do more. And one of the things we most want to do more of is funding early stage programs and early stage research that can then lead to programs that can absorb more you know, down the line. One thing that's come up when people try to think about giving to give all charities is a sort of counterfactual impact because some very, very large donors, like in theory, they may not be able to fill a give directly because you know maybe that's just such a large capacity potentially. But some of the other recommendations, if the really, really large donors wanted to, they might be able to fill like essentially the full amount, as I understand it, or maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. But I think this is sort of a, a concern or confusion some people have had saying, well, if GiveWell is not directing these really large donors that they have like tight knit relationships with to fund it fully, like why should we fund it? And sort of the right way to think about that. There's a couple answers to this question. So, you know, first off, you know, the biggest donor that, you know, we work closely with is Open Philanthropy and Open Philanthropy you know, sets its budget, you know, sort of is making its own decisions about how much to give to give all recommendations every year, has its own research staff. And, you know, we're not in a position, you know, we can make an argument to open philanthropy about, you know, why we think it should give more, but we're certainly not in a position to convince it ourselves, convince, you know, open philanthropy about what, you know, it should, it should be doing. You know, in the very short term, we currently, you know, I think in 2022, we expect to be in a position to raise a little bit more money than we're able to give away. You know, we, we think it'll amount to about 10% of our annual uh, giving. So we're sort of what we call this is rollover funds where, yes, this is exactly right. You know, out of about, you know, $750 million that we aim to direct this year, we think about 75 is going to be rolled over to 2023. But in the very near future, you know, 2024, 20, you know, 2023, 2024, I just expect the overall needs to surpass the capacity of, of donors to give. You know, it's possible we'll uh, get OpenFill to, to give even more, but, you know, OpenFill may decide that it wants to hold out for a higher cost effectiveness threshold. And then, you know, I, I think we'll be aiming to get donors to give to things that, you know, are, are really great, you know, maybe things that are five times as cost effective as cash transfers that I think is, you know, a really good deal that people should be excited to support. Hmm. So some people have made the argument that like, if you give to a give well charity that open fill could have like filled to capacity in some theoretical sense, you're like putting money into open fills coffers, which it of course will then try to use to help the world. So it's not like a bad thing per se, but that there may be like 
the counterfactual impact may not be what you think. Like, do you think that that is flawed reasoning? I understand where that reasoning is coming from. So I think it is like a very reasonable question to have. OpenPhil made a change this year where they committed large amounts of funding to give all recommendations over the next few years. 300 this year, 500 or 300 in 2021, 500 in 2022, I believe. Um, you know, that was intended to be clearer about the uh, sort of maximum amount that OpenPhil would be willing to give in the short term. You know, that said, there's a possibility. Like it's still, uh, you know, I think a donor could be concerned and say, well, isn't it possible that as GiveWell finds more opportunities, OpenPhil will continue to increase its giving? And therefore, the true counterfactual effect of a gift to give well today is adding to OpenPhil's coffers to be spent in future years. Um, I think that's actually like a reasonable concern to have uh, on February 16th, the day we're uh, re recording this, you know, February 16th, 2022. The reason that, that like I am giving to give well and I, I still would recommend that donors do is we have grown the room for more funding we have, meaning the, the sort of size of the opportunity we have extremely quickly over the last few years. And what we're aiming to do is surpass OpenPhil's ability to give. And, you know, I think we will we'll be able to do that within a few years. So I guess the, the basically, I, I think that the, in my opinion, obviously biased, is that we're going to surpass that. And that won't be an issue, you know, within a few years. And, and some of our trajectory of finding more opportunities, I think, is good evidence that we'll be able to keep it up. But to be perfectly honest, like, I don't think it would be crazy or wrong for a donor to say, you know, right now, I'm a little concerned that giving to give well is supporting open fill. I really don't want to do that. I'd rather hold on to the money myself. I can trust myself to give in two or three years and I'll just give in two or three years. Um, you know, I know donors, I talk to donors who are planning to do that. It's not the thing that I think is optimal, but I don't think it's like highly problematic as long as they uh, are, are going to trust themselves to actually give again in the future. So final question for you. Sometimes people think that over quantification comes with lots of problems that it creates. And I, I feel that I've seen this myself where people want to model something out. So they put like numbers in a spreadsheet for the thing. But then if you were to really carefully track the uncertainties, you'd realize that like the actual range of estimates is like over three orders of magnitude or something. And it's like at that point, you know, what's the point of a model at all, right? Or you realize that there's some assumptions made in some of those numbers where if like you'd made a different assumption, which could have been reasonable, you would have gotten a totally different result. So I'm wondering, is quantification go too far sometimes? And like, how do you think about addressing that? It definitely goes too far sometimes. Uh, it's a big battle that like, I feel like we're, we're fighting because on one hand you want to quantify and on the other hand, the uh, over-reliance on some number in a spreadsheet is really problematic. And so we're trying to fight against that in, in two ways. You know, the first is, you know, really always trying to think about like the, the simple case for a grant that is independent of the model itself. And that's not itself in any way sufficient, but I think it's really helpful to, as a gut check on the, the sort of quantitative or, or the number that the model spits out. And then second, trying really hard and, and, and to, to simplify models down and to say, sure, you know, we have this sort of um, I, I don't, the, the website 538 had this a few years ago. I, I really liked it when they had the deluxe version of their political predictions, the, I don't know, the advanced and then the really basic. And I think it's really helpful to have, you know, the, the super deluxe version of the model because it is like super quantified and tells you something, but then also just give yourself like sort of an overly simplified gut check on what the, um, you know, the, the, the complicated model shows as a way of trying to, you know, uh, to, to triangulate your view and not be overly reliant on just like one particular set of numbers. Yeah, I like that approach a lot, like really trying to hone in on, okay, but like what are the few factors that are driving this and does that make intuitive sense or is this spitting out nonsense? <laughs> yeah, or another question we try to ask is like, let's say the numbers didn't exist, would we still make the grant? You know, if not, why not? If yes, why? And you know, that that's just, it's not like we're, we're not making grants qualitatively, but we're always trying to like ask that qualitative question as a way of thinking more critically about the decisions we're making and um, not being overly reliant on some number. Right. I mean, essentially, these two different methods of like a qualitative evaluation of the impact and a quantitative one, they both have flaws, but they're sort of not the same flaws. So they together, they kind of enhance each other. Yeah, totally. Ellie, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. 
Thanks again for listening. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com, or you can call and leave us a voicemail at 321-341-4669. To find out more about Spencer, visit spencergreenberg.com. To find out more about Ellie, take a look at his bio in the show notes. And to find out more about our show, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com. If you like the show, we hope you'll rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts, and we hope you'll tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. You can sign up for that newsletter on our website, clearerthinkingpodcast.com. Before we wrap up the episode, though, here is this week's listener question. A listener wrote in to ask, how do you choose guests to invite on the podcast? When it comes to who to invite on the podcast, I think about a few different things. One is, does this person have valuable ideas to share? Ideas that will help people understand the world better or improve their lives. Second, I think about, will these ideas be novel to the listener? You know, there's some great ideas that everyone's already heard many times, and so it's not that useful to bring that on. And then the third is a kind of eloquence of speaking because someone could have brilliant ideas, but just not be very good expressing them in real time. And so it just wouldn't work very well for a podcast.